first. What's up, gang? Welcome to Room and Board. My name is Chris George, and today we are taking a look at The Seventh Continent by Sirius Pulp Games. You have been cursed. The renowned explorer who has recently returned from an expedition to the mysterious Seventh Continent. But wait, you say, doesn't the world already have a Seventh Continent? To which I say yes, but this is the Seventh Continent, a mysterious land located off the coast of Antarctica. Our Seventh Continent. Wait, we're off to a good start. In order to break the curse, you gotta get your sweet little 1900s booty back to the Seventh Continent, not to be confused with the Seventh Continent, and explore a land filled with mystery. So much mystery, in fact, that you don't remember anything about the expedition that you've literally just returned from. Because you're cursed! All right, it's a game of exploration, cryptic riddles, and desperately trying to get off an island before you die of starvation. Let's get it on. But first, with a lot of these campaign games, there is a huge emphasis on no spoilers, no spoilers, no spoilers. So people won't even show you a single card, a single image, because everything nowadays is a spoiler. Awaken Realms. Do not worry, I'm not going to ruin the discovery aspects for you. I want you to have fun and have a good time, and the discovery and exploration is a large part of that. That being said, I am going to show you some stuff, but anything that you see here is something you will see in the rule book or within the first minutes of the game. I have your back. There's nothing here that will spoil the experience other than my negative review. <laughs> I'll also say if you own the game and have yet to play it, I would check out our Play It Now video for Seventh Continent, which will be located in the description below. And this will get you set up to start playing it right away and give you just enough information needed to get you on your journey. Don't watch this review, go watch that instead. But for the rest of you, here we go. Beginning of the game, after picking your character from a mishmash of explorers, you start on an island knowing only a fragment of a previous adventure that has left you cursed. You'll choose a curse, shuffle the corresponding cards into your communal deck, keeping the other half for the clue that it provides. This will also tell you how to set up based upon the specific curse that you're doing. Here you can see the initial setup for the recommended first curse, the Voracious Goddess. So by using the clues from your former self or previous explorers, you must explore the island and uncover the mysteries of the land. The exploration is where this game shines. At the beginning of the game, you start on a single map tile surrounded by mist. In order to reveal subsequent map tiles, you must first brave whatever challenge the mist throws at you. This can be anything from encountering a raging mama bear to finding a useful item that will make certain tasks along your journey significantly easier. Sometimes when I drift off to sleep, I think of the mist, just the two of us, hand and vapor shaped hand, our bodies getting closer, its tendrils. <clears throat> Sorry, forgot where I was there for a second. In addition, each map tile will generally have a number of things that you can do on it. Climb a mountain, search a campsite, eat a weird plant, listen to the sounds of the sea. Anything you do could result in something amazing or something completely terrible. So go ahead, poke the jellyfish. What could go wrong? Or right. The most precious resource in this game, however, is time, which is represented by this communal player deck because everything you attempt to do will require you to draw cards. Sometimes you'll need to draw a certain number of stars to accomplish your goal and other times you won't need to draw any stars at all, but will still need to draw cards representing your ever dwindling life force. When the deck runs out, you're out of time. Your body is ready to give out at any moment as you draw cards from the discard pile. And if you happen to draw a curse, you die. It's a gigantic game of choose your own adventure, but with cards instead of goosebumps and the act of exploring this island is awesome. It's exciting. The terrain changes just quickly enough as you go from lush jungles to arid deserts and frigid tundras. Some map tiles have hidden numbers on them, which if spotted, allow you to uncover secrets of the island, while others 
have various plants on them that you're only able to use if you've uncovered the research papers that explain to you how those plants can help you. There's a lot to do and explore. Until, of course, you spend too much time doing meaningless things and you starve and die. And then you have to reset the game and start all over again. Now, this is an aspect of the game that I was really excited about. The aspect of dying and starting again. And when I first died, I thought, okay, now I have to be more streamlined. Use the knowledge that I've learned and forge an even more efficient path. Because I don't know where my next meal is coming from. It's through food that you can replenish your deck. And this seemed like a really exciting puzzle to work out of you working against the game and getting to your goal as efficiently and quickly as possible. And when I stumbled upon that first watering hole right as my deck was dwindling to its last few cards and I was able to see a plethora of animals that I could hunt and eat and replenish my deck back to its full capacity, it was a glorious feeling. I've never felt such euphoria. I thought, where could this game possibly go from here? And then in between that and the second watering hole, not much changed. My deck was still dwindling and I arrived and I thought, oh, oh, I've been here before. But at least the tension of the starvation was always still there. I still had to be efficient with my wanderings around because I still only had a limited amount of actions. Until you realize that there's a really easy way to game this system. And in fact, the rule book actually encourages it. You may want to skip this part if you don't want any strategy tips. In the rule book, they say that they don't intend for this game to be left out forever, but to be played in one to two hour play sessions and for you to pack it away when you're done those sessions. And the act of packing away the game, you put back all the cards that you used basically for that session, barring some specifics. You therefore replenish all the food sources that you hunted and then are able to hunt them again. You see where I'm going with this. So since the food replenishes, the logical thing to do is find a watering hole, hunt until you've replenished your deck, save the game by taking away all the cards you've just explored, putting them into the deck, restarting your computer, I mean board game, hunt until you've collected all the meat you can possibly hold, which should be more than enough to get you to the next watering hole, rinse and repeat and repeat and repeat. With this discovery, any tension that you may have felt around dying of starvation, which remember was a very tense thing for my first couple attempts, vanishes. And the game becomes an endless slog of rinsing and repeating instead of an exciting journey of exploration and tough choices. Two hours into the Voracious Goddess, I died and I was still excited. Four hours into the Voracious Goddess, I was still having fun. By eight hours into the first curse, it was still fun, but the game was starting to feel repetitive. And at 14 hours into the curse, I just wanted to finish so that I could pack this thing up and never have to play this game again. The previously enjoyable mystery of the island has evaporated and you're left wandering around an empty world, retracing your steps over and over because you may have missed something. I've heard that the voracious goddess is supremely long compared to all the other curses. And while I understand that because you want to set up the island and introduce a large swath of the island for when you do subsequent curses, you can say, oh yeah, I've been here before. I don't necessarily think it's a great choice because while the exploration is fun, and remember, it is great, the exploring, crafting items along the way, learning all the new things about the world, it's awesome. But once you've explored a location, there's not really all that much to do when the game inevitably sends you backtracking in that direction. See, it's not the length of the adventures that bother me or the playtime. I love a good three to four hour playtime. It's the repetitive upkeep that the system requires you to do that just kills it. Hunting becomes tedious when you know the mechanics, sure. But what's even worse is being constantly forced to rifle through the Rolodex of cards, looking for a number, 
read a slight blurb of text, only to repeat that Rolodex process less than 30 seconds later. I played this solo and I'm convinced I spent more time taking cards out of the box and putting them back into the box than I did making actual gameplay decisions. And remember, this took me 20 hours. That's over 10 hours of mindlessly looking for cards, taking them out, and putting them back in. Not to mention if I had died 14 hours in, dying at two hours, that was fine. But if I had died 14 hours in and the game made me reset everything just to do it all over again, when I know what the island looks like and I know where I'm going to be going, let me put it this way. If your favorite part of the Unlock Escape Room series is reorganizing the box so you can give it away to your friend, eh, then you might like Seventh Continent. Or if you wish you could be a librarian before computers were invented, who has to stay late and catalog the entire library, well, then you might like Seventh Continent. I'm being perhaps unnecessarily harsh, but the fact is that if this was a video game, I would probably recommend it. And in fact, I'd probably still be playing it because the exploration is fun. And if I had a computer that could automate everything, I would continue to enjoy the exploration and the crafting elements and even the survival elements. Hunting is satisfying in a way, even though it becomes tedious. And when I finally would come across that stretch of cards, that secret temple that I hadn't found, and I got to explore again 17 hours into the game, my enthusiasm started to come back. It was fun. It felt awesome until I was done and I went outside the temple and I had to pull out all the cards that the game had literally just instructed me to put back into the box because I had transitioned to another area. <sighs> Some things just work better as a video game. And while board games are exciting because of their tactile nature, this was way too tactile and not enough experience. Now, if this doesn't dissuade you from getting Seventh Continent, I would recommend just getting the base box. That is all you need. You do not need any of the extra content. Don't feel like you're missing out on anything from the Kickstarter content. Right now on Serious Pulp website, you can get it for $59 US, which goes up to $69 on May 17th. So if you are interested in purchasing Seventh Continent, Now's the time to do so before their production costs increase. But you don't need anything else. I got this as part of a bundle. So I also got the What Goes Up Must Go Down expansion, which adds a bunch of extra curses. Three additional curses that the previous owner bought. In addition with a mini expansion, a play mat, a bone and dice bag, a cartographer's notebook, and a deluxified satchel and journal that they also gave out with the Kickstarter. All of these do nothing. I'll get to the accessories in a minute, but the expansion itself, I barely came across within my 20 hours of play. And I really think that if you're interested in the Seven Continent, you should get the base game first before you decide to layer up on all sorts of expansions. Because all the expansions do, they add in more curses, which are essentially different adventures, different paths that you need to take on the island, and different mysteries to solve. The only part of the additional content that I ended up running into, and that I know I ran into, is something called the Creature Comforts expansion, which was really fun. I found a little egg, and I was able to nurture it into a friend. I love that little guy. Do I think you need to pay an extra 10 bucks to get these however many cards there were? No you don't. It was a nice little touch to help deepen the world, but again, just go for the base game. Especially do not go for the accessories bundle. Now the accessories bundle on the Series Pulp website, you will get this satchel and journal, deluxified cartographer's notebook, bone and dice bag, and playmat, which is coincidentally the four things that I have right here. Do not purchase this package. I am offended by how useless these items are for your actual game. So let's break it down first. First we have the playmat. I'll pull this out just to get out of the way. This is your standard neoprene playmat. 
But if you can see, there are these little squares where you can put cards. And you can build your map outwards like that. The thing is, because this game is ever expanding, and the rule in the rule book is get rid of pieces of the map when you run out of room on your table, this play mat is next to useless. You're gonna want to fill up your table as much as possible so you don't have to worry about the annoying putting cards back into your box only to take them out minutes later when you feel you have to go backwards. This was 20 bucks on Kickstarter and adds nothing to the game experience. Don't get it. Next, we've got this cartographer's notebook. This is 10 bucks for a big old notebook of tiles, map tiles, they're all the same. I guess this is to write down what parts of the island are where in between game sessions. You spend enough time on this island anyway that it shouldn't be a problem. And it's not even big enough. It's only four rows wide. It doesn't make sense. If someone knows what this is for or used it and enjoyed using it, please write in the comments below because I cannot fathom why anyone would ever need this notebook, ever. Don't get that. Next, we have the bone and dice bag. So this is kind of neat. You can get these for um, $12 US. You get eight little dice. They're really lightweight. If you like dice, you may want to get them. But the thing is, you never roll dice in this game. The dice are used purely as a way to track the durability of your items. That's it. That's the only application for these dice. So in essence, they could just be a dial or a number of cardboard tokens, but they decided to use dice and that's fine. However, when you're looking down at your items, the whole point of the dice is you can see what durability they are. And these are so hard to read from a distance because they're kind of cool that at a glance, you can't look and see what your items are. So in essence, these actually make the game more difficult to play, which seems ridiculous as an add-on. This bag to store them in has no practical application. It's just a waste of money. And you can get cooler custom dice somewhere else. Don't get that. And then finally, you have this satchel and journal, which is really cool. It's great quality. You have all these little sleeves in here where you can take any bits of information that you found throughout your journey and put them into the satchel and leaf through them to see the information. However, you're going to be getting various bits of information throughout the game that pertain to different things. And so unless you want to be constantly having more things to take out and reorganize every time you get additional cards, I really thought this was gonna be cool. In terms of gameplay applications, it is significantly better to just have all of your notes in a pile on the table, so that way you can sift through them and look at them effectively, rather than have to leaf through and try to reorganize. It just doesn't work, and it's a real shame because it's gorgeous, but it just doesn't work from a gameplay application. And about an hour in, I abandoned it completely. It makes me mad at how useless these add-ons are. From a gameplay perspective, these do not matter at all. I'm trying to think of a reason why anyone would get them. I would never be persuaded to spend money on those though, because they make the game worse. And why are you adding things that make the game worse? <sighs> That's my tangent. That's my rant. Just get the base game. I have to admit that for $59 US for all the content that you are getting in here, because remember the first curse lasted me so long, you are getting a long game. So for dollar to hour value, it's pretty decent if this is a game that interests you. I believe when Seventh Continent premiered in 2016, end of 2016, beginning of 2017, people were starting to get their copies from Kickstarter. It really did pioneer a type of board game that we hadn't yet seen. It's an incredibly ambitious project and they have succeeded in creating an open sandbox world on a scale which I have yet to see in any other game. You can go anywhere and do some things. 
But in this case, I can't help thinking that large doesn't necessarily mean better. And if the first curse wasn't so unnecessarily long, maybe divided into bite-sized chunks where I felt I would had actually accomplished something, it would go down a lot more smoothly. This would give players logical gaming stopping points rather than an endless sprawling, eh, stop whatever you want type of attitude. One of the reasons I didn't stop, I played this pretty much two days straight, is that I never felt these sorts of accomplishments or these sorts of stopping points. And reviewing this in 2021, five years later, even the creators know that this isn't that fun. Because in the Kickstarter for Seven Citadel, they emphasize that the main changes to the game is that survival won't be a key element. So the idea of hunting, crafting, and dying and resetting everything is going to be the main difference between this and Seventh Citadel. And I can only assume that is going to be a great thing. And I'm really hopeful that Seventh Citadel will fix a lot of my issues with the Seventh Continent and provide a potentially a much richer experience than Seventh Continent. Unfortunately, after my experience with Seventh Continent, I don't know if you could pay me to play Seventh Citadel. It broke me. And actually it's taken me so long to do this review because every time I'd pull out the box and try to set it up, I was hit with waves of PTSD of the anger and the frustration that I felt throughout the game. <laughs> I mean, in that sense, maybe it's the most thematic game I've ever played because the curses felt so, so real. The bottom line is that while the Seventh Continent offers a rich, expansive world, a fun premise, and many discoveries and secrets for those patient enough to find them, it also relies too heavily on the same tricks with no increase in payoff, just an increase in upkeep, and inevitably overstays its welcome. I hope you found this review helpful and that my suffering was at least somewhat entertaining. If you own Seventh Continent, don't let this review stop you. Play it. Play it now. In fact, check out our Play It Now in the description below if you want me to help you set it up and show the initial stages. Uh, to everyone else, thank you so much for tuning in. It really means the world to me, and I appreciate you immensely. And as always, I love hearing about your experiences with games. So make sure to write your experience with Seven Continent in the comments below. Did you like it? Do you agree with me? Am I full of baloney? <laughs> <laughs> Almost said a bad word there. <laughs> because not only do I like hearing your experiences, I'm sure they will be helpful to anyone who is watching this review as well. Until next time, thank you for watching. My name is Chris George, and I still don't have a catchphrase. Bye. See you on the flip side? Huh, that seems like it's never been done.